So uh, welcome everyone to our event today. Um, I would like to thank Adelina of Tene um, and the Criminal Justice Coalition for today's event called Defunding the Police, Defining the Way Forward for HRM. Um, I'm Sierra Viteo. I'm your moderator for today's event. I'm a second year student at the Schulich School of Law and the current Vice President of Careers of the Dalhousie Criminal Law Students Association. Um, before I introduce our speakers today, I would like to hand it over to Kelsey Jones, who is the director of the Indigenous Black in Mi'kmaq program at the law school to give our land acknowledgement for tonight. Good evening, everyone. I would like to begin this event by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq, Wolastawig, and Passamaquoddy's people first signed with the British crown in 1726. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wolastawig title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We are all treaty people. I also would like to recognize the over 400 year history of communities of African descent in Nova Scotia and the 52 African Nova Scotian communities throughout the region today. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for that, Kelsey. Now to introduce our speakers. Um, first, we have Elle Jones. Elle is a poet, journalist, professor, and activist living in Halifax. Along with numerous awards and accolades for her achievements, Elle has received her PhD in cultural studies from Queen's University and is an assistant professor in the Department of Political and Canadian Studies at Saint, uh, Mount St. Vincent University. Um, Elle, if you'd like to, could you please uh, just give a brief description of your role uh, for this report? Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for having us and for all the work that went into creating this event. I know it takes a lot of work on the back end. Um, I was the, I, I mean, it's not really a hierarchical thing. So officially, I was the chair of the subcommittee to define defunding the police, but that was very collective work. It wasn't work that like one person controlled. Um, it was work that we all did together. So um, whether people's names are, you know, um, and the head of the report or not isn't really relevant. Um, so this is based in generations of work that came before us and then really trying to create a different kind of process. So um, I was part of the team that was writing, trying to engage with community, trying to push this forward, but there were so many other people around that as well. Thank you so much for joining us, Elle. Our next speaker is Jennifer Taylor. Uh, Jen graduated from the Schulich School of Law in 2008 and currently practices at Stuart McKelvey here in Halifax. Uh, she's active in the legal community, acting as a mentor for the Dalhousie Feminist Legal Association, and she's also a member of the Nova Scotia Policing Policy Working Group. Uh, welcome, Jen. Could you please introduce uh, yourself and your role on the panel? Sure, thank you, Sierra. I got into this work because of the Nova Scotia Policing Policy Working Group, bit of a mouthful, but we're a subcommittee of the East Coast Prison Justice Society. And we started working together back in the summer of 2020. And that led into working on this report and supporting Elle and the rest of the community. In terms of the nuts and bolts of the report, I helped with the writing and did a lot of editing. So you can blame me for any typos that you find. I'm sure there won't be many, Jen. <laughs> Our last speaker today is Harry Critchley. Um, Harry is a third year law student at the Schulich School of Law. Um, with extensive experience in community legal work, he is the current co-chair of the East Coast Prison Justice Society, the vice chair of the board of directors for the Elizabeth Fry Society of Mainland Nova Scotia, and a member of the Halifax Board of Police Commissioners. Uh, welcome, Harry. Thanks, Sierra. I, I really appreciate um, the introduction and, and all the work that I know went into this event. Uh, thanks so much to the Criminal Justice Coalition in particular. Um, I guess my my uh, to echo what L uh, said, the, the report and the work that went into it was, was really a collective effort. Uh, there was a, a large number of uh, subcommittee members drawn from different communities in the HR who contributed their insights and their perspectives, who provided feedback on drafts of the report. Um, I wasn't actually on the subcommittee. I was brought on uh, to assist with some of the research, uh, particularly around um, doing literature reviews, looking at what are uh, new uh, programs and projects being piloted in different jurisdictions, what are best practices. And so I played a role in, in uh, doing some of that research 
uh, in supervising uh, student volunteers who also assist with research, and then in, uh, in the writing. I guess one other thing I, I will say is I did a lot of that um, before I was on the Halifax Board of Police Commissioners, and um, I am now a member of, of that board. And so uh, I'm here tonight to speak as a, 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 an author, as a contributor to the report. And, but nothing that I'm going to say is representative of the view of Halifax Police Board, uh, Halifax Police, or the City of Halifax. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to get that out of the way. Sierra, can I just jump in? I forgot to shout out Francesco and Mariah, who are two Shulik Law students who did some research and writing for this report through the Pro Bono Dalhousie program. So shout out to them and thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you for the work that you and your team has put into this. Um, so before getting into asking about the content of the report, um, specifically the recommendations, I wanted to ask about the circumstances sort of leading to the initiation of the report. What sort of issues did you find were happening in HRM and nationally or cross nationally um, that made you realize that this was something that needed to be undertaken as a task? Yes, I'll go first and then maybe we can reverse order or something later. Um, the first thing I want to say just to situate this a little bit is that while defunding kind of swept into the public consciousness in 2020, particularly following George Floyd, it is certainly not a new idea, nor is it a new tactic. I was in a seminar with Andrea Ritchie yesterday, and she reminded us that, of course, during enslavement, defunding demands were made. The sugar boycotts, for example, not one more drop of blood, every grain of sugar, a drop of blood, the very famous, am I not a man and a brother, um, China that was sold, right? So that was a defunding demand, defund slavery. Of course, apartheid was a giant global defunding demand, stop funneling money into a country that uses this to militarize and police in order to keep black people oppressed. The Black Panther Plan, one of the 10 points was a defunding demand, put money into housing, education, jobs, right? So throughout history, there have been these demands and this has been used as a strategy and tactic by virtually every justice movement. And so framing it as defunding may seem relatively new to people and particularly people who came to this discourse in 2020, but is in fact a very historic, um, it, it comes out of a long legacy of action in black communities, in indigenous communities, in social justice communities in general. Um, but yes, particularly in 2020, people became aware of um, you know, this phrase that was going around defund the police, including our board of police that um, was in trying to engage in debate upon what this meant, um, but came up with a definition. Harry can, maybe I should put this one on Harry. The definition was um, have the police do policing tasks and have them not do non-policing tasks. So beyond being a circular definition, the problem with that is everything the police do becomes policing tasks. And part of the problem, in fact, as we've downloaded so many more responsibilities to the police is that policing tasks have grown to be virtually everything in society. Like we've, the police have gradually been not only funded more, but also we've seen their areas of responsibility um, increase. So that was a definition that didn't mean anything. So through the policy working group, we wrote a letter critiquing that and we are engaging with them trying to get something different and that's what the defunding report came out of so when I engaged with the board through um, as we were sort of saying okay this definition doesn't work they initially just wanted a definition that did work essentially so they're like okay well you give us a definition um, and we went back to the policy working group and thought about what would it mean what did we actually want what would be the point of a definition and amongst ourselves we recognized that the problem wasn't defining defunding, the problem was putting it into action, defining that in policy, shifting a lot of the public ideology around policing, thinking about the role of policing and discipline and control and punishment in our society, something we're seeing happening in Ottawa right now that's kind of forcing a conversation about police. We wanted to do something and engage with those bigger ideas and not just said, okay, it's, it's this, this, and this. And that's where the report came from and particularly our insistence upon that this must be done in a way that publicly engaged, that engaged the people like service organizations who if we were defunding police would be the ones picking up those roles. So we really wanted to create a bit of a ecosystem around this definition and something really practical um, to show that these aren't ideas that are just theoretical. Like I said, they're not brand new, they're not strange, they're treated as radical and new, but they're actually quite practical. So in creating a report, we wanted something that was very evidence-based, that had a lot of data, that had these jurisdictional scans to show that if these things aren't taking place, it's not because they're imaginary. It's actually because of choices that are made by police boards and councils, and because in often a, a lack of 
imagination and social policy, and often then just a lack of reality in social policy. Um, that our conception of what policing is and what policing actually does, our desires for police versus how policing actually looks like on the ground, those are often very different. So we wanted something to try and intervene in that and also take the conversation that had been happening where people were like, okay, take money from police and give it to housing. We wanted to sort of enter that space of how, how might that take place? What would that look like if a board or council or municipality undertook that work? So that was really where the report was grounded. And I'll let the other two people take it from here. Yeah, maybe I'll just say a few words, L, about the working group, um, because the, the working group is, you know, is not the author of, of the report, but, it, you know, like that, for instance, like my role as assisting with research came from East Coast Prison Justice, which, you know, as Jen mentioned, the working group is part of. And so I just want to say a little bit about kind of how that got started. Um, and partly that that's, has to do with personal relationships, right? So. Um, East Coast Prison Justice as an organization we've been around since 2017 and a number of people, uh, Dr. Tenney, for example, is, is a member of East Coast Prison Justice, quite involved with uh, one of our projects regarding human rights monitoring in provincial jails. But as an organization, for a long time, we had a very strong focus on um, uh, working with, assisting and advocating for people in the provincial jails. Uh, and um, you know, we've worked on a number of legal advocacy, legal research, legal education projects for people in that area. Uh, and starting in 2018, we initiated a project which kind of culminated in 2019 on um, deaths in care and custody. And so uh, unfortunately working with uh, people in, in custody and the families of people in custody, it is a reality that um, a large number of people die in, in really horrific circumstances. And uh, when that happens, uh, the families of, of of those individuals are often left basically totally in the dark, right? They're they're shut down entirely by the Department of Justice. They're shut down by the relevant government body that was, um, uh, you know, in, in charge of uh, taking care of that person. You know, a really good example is uh, there was a fellow who died at Burnside Jail in 2014, uh, Clay Cromwell, and uh, his family is still fighting for unredacted uh, report into how he died. Uh, you know now. Uh, nearly eight years later. And so uh, we started to work with a number of these families. And at that time, there was a, the province was trying to push through some really horrific amendments to a piece of legislation called the Fatality Investigations Act. So this is all a bit roundabout, right? I swear I'll bring it back to policing. Um, and Nova Scotia is one of only three provinces in Canada where if someone dies in the care or custody of the government, there's not a mandatory independent inquiry. Uh, so most other provinces in Canada, basically everywhere, uh, Quebec and to the West, uh, if someone dies in government care or custody, so that could be a psychiatric facility, a jail, a group home for a child, uh, there's a mandatory independent process that's initiated either through the coroner's office or through the medical examiner, which turns into what's called a fatality inquiry, which is usually headed by a judge. And we're one of three provinces in Canada where it's discretionary. Uh, it's actually at the discretion of either the medical examiner, which is a political appointment, or the minister to decide whether to do one of those uh, inquiries. And as you can expect, being discretionary, we don't do them very often. Uh, there was one done in 2009 called the Hyde Inquiry. And uh, there was the uh, restorative inquiry into the School for Colored Children. And then uh, now there's an inquiry. Uh, and that's despite the fact that over a dozen people have died in provincial jails and federal prisons in Nova Scotia in, in the last 10 years. And you know, in, in many, many of those cases, people called for uh, public inquiries. And so through doing that work, a number of us got connected with uh, the family of a fellow named Corey Rogers. And Corey uh, died in the Halifax drunk tank in 2016. And his mother, uh, Jeanette Rogers, who's in her late 70s, is I think the most courageous person that I know. Uh, she has basically worked tirelessly since Corey's death to uh, push for not only first accountability, but then progressive reform. Uh, so Corey's death was a really tragic one and, and really, really unnecessary. Uh, Corey had long-standing substance use disorder uh, and he was arrested outside of the IWK after becoming highly intoxicated when he wasn't allowed to see his newborn baby. Uh, he self-harmed on the way to the, uh, the police station. Um, but despite the self-harm and despite the fact that he was basically catatonic by the time they arrived at the station, 
the police decided not to take him to um, the hospital. And instead, what they did was they put a spit hood on his head, which was a mesh bag. Uh, and that bag was never removed. And ultimately, he asphyxiated and died in the drunk tank. And so, uh, th you know, this has led to a, a variety of different legal proceedings. There was a civil matter that settled. There's uh, disciplinary matters which settled um, late last year. There's ongoing criminal matters that were appealed and now are going to be retried for the commissioners. So uh, we started working quite a lot with uh, Ms. Rogers on a number of her matters. And one thing in particular was after the two civilian staff who were implicated in Corey's death uh, were charged criminally, uh, one of the retorts from the police was that there was insufficient staffing in the drum tank. Uh, there weren't simply weren't enough staff there uh, for them to supervise everyone safely. And that derived from a finding at the trial, which was that despite the fact that they were required by policy to do checks every 15 minutes, they were checking them every four hours or so. And that's how he managed to die. Um, and so uh, we thought this was just absolutely crazy that uh, in response to the tragic death of an individual, it, uh, basically directly as a result of the criminalization of substance use, um, that you would invest more resources into a failed system. And so together with Jeanette and uh, another one of our, our members, Dr. Lee again, she was a doctor with Mobile Every Street Help. Uh, we spoke to the board and said, look, this is not an evidence-based solution. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be criminalizing mental health and substance use issues. Uh, and here's an example that's used around Canada. We did some research. We found this example of a sobering center, right, as a civilian alternative. And one other thing that I wanted to mention is that Dr. Jones was at that uh, same board meeting as well, <laughs> raised a lot of very similar issues regarding lack of accountability with the board. And I can tell you that Dr. Jones was treated markedly different than I was uh, and Dr. Genge were, uh, you know, to the point where um, uh, a former commissioner uh, asked Dr. Jones at the end of her presentation whether she had anything nice to say about the police. Uh, and so that was the kind of standard that we were dealing with early on. And so that was all sort of in the background. We were doing this early work. Eventually, the work around sobering centers has kind of culminated, and now the city is going to invest in the model. But hopefully, actually, even in this uh, in the new fiscal year, we'll, we'll get started here in Halifax, which is very exciting. But uh, just to echo Elle's point that um, Defunding obviously has a long tradition in Black and Indigenous communities, but it also kind of fits with our, our intuitions about best practices and evidence-based solutions, right? That, uh, you know, there's that classic quote that it's the definition of insanity to, to do the same thing twice and expect a different result, right? And that was sort of the, the tragedy associated with Corey and his death. Um, really, I think, spelled that out very clearly because his death was, was an unavoidable one and it, it wasn't actually a unique one. There was a number of individuals, uh, both specifically in Halifax and uh, in Nova Scotia and across Canada who've died in these types of settings uh, in the last couple of years. In HRM alone, there's been three people who died in the last five years, uh, sorry, in the last 10 years. And so um, that's just a bit of background and that was um, specifically how our organization, East Coast Prison Justice, came to be involved with the working group. That's great. Thank you so much, Harry. Uh, before I turn it over to you, Jennifer, I just wanted to remind participants that you are able to ask questions um, just in the Q&A box at the bottom there. Sure, I'll just, I don't have a ton to add to my brilliant co-panelist comments. Um, as Elle said, you know, defunding can seem like such a complex and radical concept. And like we wrote a 218 page report. We didn't just give the board a definition and move on, right? Like we did give this a lot of substantive attention, but as also as Elle said, we need to really think about defunding in a practical sense. And something that also happened in June 2020 when we were starting our advocacy was the armored vehicle purchase cancellation here in Halifax. Um, I think it was in 2019 that council had decided to buy an armored vehicle, like a giant tank for the Halifax Regional Police. It did get some play in the media at that time, but not a, not a ton until the murder of George Floyd really prompted this re-examination of how we spend our municipal money on policing here in Halifax. And there was a huge public outcry and council voted to cancel the purchase of the armored vehicle. 
And I think that is such a really concrete anecdote of how defunding can work in practice because council also decided to take that money and put it towards anti-Black racism initiatives. And we can discuss whether that has happened or has been effective, but I think it really shows the two key pieces of defunding, which are, you do have to look at the money, funding is in the word, but you also have to reimagine where the money you're taking away from the police can go. So I would encourage people to read up on that if they're looking for a concrete example that happened here in Halifax. That's great, thank you all so much for that. Um, and as was mentioned by Al and Jennifer, you as well, uh, the difficulty with the definition of defunding, um, and Harry, just your anecdote too of how Dr. Jones was received um, after discussing her presentation. Uh, we know that terms like defunding and detasking police are often met with sometimes vehement opposition. And I find a lot of times that opposition comes from a place of misunderstanding um, or just not understanding the full picture of what those terms actually mean. Um, so I would like to ask the panel here, um, what does defunding and detasking the police mean in terms of the report that you've created here? Um, and can you provide some examples um, that we can use uh, for context just to understand that? Mary, go ahead. <laughs> I know you like to talk about the pillars. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the pillars. Um, well, I guess um, when, we, as Elle said, right, the, the simple thing is, is finding the thing. You know, it's this idea of, uh, you know, and as Jennifer mentioned, taking the money away from one thing and reimagining where, to, where else could go. But we really wanted to put um, some meat on the bones that kind of operationalize the idea. And so we came up with this idea of uh, four pillars. And the idea really was to have an expanding circle, right? So that was we started with things that are internal to the operation of the police themselves and then kind of branching out towards larger social reforms. And I think a, a basic idea um, that underlies the reform, the whole kind of suite of reforms and recommendations that make up the different pillars was kind of twofold. So one was the idea that um, they should be measured and they should be drawn from uh, kind of community perspectives and community buy-in, right? So, you know, they, the, they should be drawn from the community and they should be reflective of the community, right? They should go back to the community. And then the second piece, which I don't think we ever say explicitly in the, the report, because maybe it'd be a bit too academic -y, but was kind of this difference between, and maybe I'll can say a bit more about this, what are called reformist reforms and non-reformist reforms. Uh, and this is an idea that uh, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, I always associate it with her, uh, but this idea that there are certain kinds of reforms that keep the, the structure and keep the problem in place, but just placate it or address its symptoms. And so a classic example, I think, in the policing context is body cameras, right? It, it raises the, the budget. Uh, it creates all sorts of other associated issues with privacy. It, uh, there's limited research that suggests it actually does do the thing that we want it to do, uh, but it keeps the structure of policing more or less the same, and it keeps our social structures more generally the same. And non-reformist reforms are ones that don't do that, right? They basically are aimed at changing the social structure, right, and, and changing real material conditions for people. And so I think those are the kind of the two ideas underlying the sorts of reforms that were uh, recommended, right, in the, in the pillars. And I think that comes through in, in a really two really concrete ways. So one is I've already mentioned is this, you know, we, we explicitly recommend against body cameras. We went through, they've done these really, really extensive meta-analyses, which are sort of gold standard social science, and concluded that there's not really statistically significant evidence at this point to suggest that they are effective uh, in the ways that we want them to be. Uh, and that research has been done both in Canada and the United States. And so citing that, we sort of say like, in light of the cost and the, the other implications of this practice, right, the privacy implications, for example, we're not in support of it. And then another one uh, that I think maybe surprised people a little bit more was that we rec we didn't recommend any further training. Um, and um, training is a very, very common recommendation in virtually every kind of report dealing with policing. And we cite a couple examples where training recommendations have been presented. For example, in the Wortley report, uh, he recommends that the police implement mandatory anti-bias training. And basically, in keeping with this idea of non-reformist reforms, we didn't recommend training for sort of two reasons. The first was that um, uh, it, there's 
not a lot of accountability mechanisms in place to ensure that the police actually uh, follow through and do the training that's requested. And that's, for example, the case I would suggest with the anti-bias training from Wardley. So you had uh, earlier this last year, uh, Nova Scotia Human Rights Tribunal decision, which came forward and found that uh, the um, Journey to Change program, one of the anti-racism programs that the HRP had developed, is still in the pilot stage. Uh, it's totally optional, and it's only been delivered to a very small percentage of officers. And their other program, which isn't an anti-racist program, it's just called Bias-Free Policing, was offered once in 2009 and then not again until 2018. Right? So there's real serious gaps in terms of actually their delivery of these programs. And then the second piece was um, there's not a lot of we couldn't guarantee that the, the training would fulfill the purpose that we want it to fill, right? That we, it would address the concerns that we have. And for instance, I noted that uh, Chris Giacomatonio is here, right? Who used to be the researcher for HRP. And so we cite something that he wrote, right? Where uh, he looked at the efficacy of a program that the police did called Verbal Judo, which was a de-escalation uh, program. And Chris is an excellent social scientist and he looked at 15 markers of behavioral change and he found that there was only statistically significant change in five of them. And they were the most basic ones, right? And they had to do with things like introducing yourself, right? And saying what your name was. And that there wasn't significant change in the more complex ones. And that another piece of uh, the research that he found was that the effect of the training went down as officer experience went up, right? So that was another example, right? That uh, kind of guided by this idea of non-performance reforms. We weren't that interested to um, uh, recommend more training. Maybe I'll turn it over to El, though, to talk a little bit about the other pillars, or I could say a bit more about that if you like. I'm trying to make you talk because you don't get to do Harry, obviously, because he's on the board, doesn't get to do a lot of these events. So I have, I'm like, let's defer, let's let Harry speak a bit. Um, the heart for many people of defunding is detasking, which you can also think of as retasking, as in retasking community. Um, and that's quite simply removing tasks from the police and placing them where they can be either more efficiently done better done, more appropriately done. The biggest example of this is mental health interventions, of course. Um, in Halifax, currently, we do not have cop-free mental health interventions. So if you call the mobile mental high crisis unit, which many people think is like not calling the police, it is still accompanied by plainclothes officers. And as a result, there have been many, many incidents where people have called for help thinking that they're going to get paramedics or going to get a counselor or something and you get police in a case that happened a few years ago there was a family whose daughter took um lsd and then began basically tripping in her room so they you know they called for help and the police came in and ended up uh tasing her i believe and um she was left covered in bruises in her own bedroom when all her parents wanted was help and there's of course many 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 cases of this we know that 60 percent of fatal interactions with the police uh, begin with mental health calls and of course that intersects with race, with immigration status, language status. Um, so that's a, a really sort of popular and very familiar example, right? That many, many people, even if they will say overall they don't support defunding, most people, by the way, including many police themselves, agree that the police are not equipped to do this work. They're not trained social workers. They're not crisis interveners. They don't have the capacity to connect people to other services. So that's a really, um, perhaps a very common familiar example to people, the idea that why are the police engaged in intervening and what is a health crisis? Harry mentioned the Hyde report that began with mental health crisis. This is a man who was in a mental health crisis. His family called for help. And because he was on a warrant, he was like returned to the cells. I think he had some prior criminalization. I don't think he was on a warrant. Don't let me get it wrong. But he had, you know, because he was a priorly criminalized person, he ended up in the cells instead of in a hospital and he ended up dead. And this happens over and over and again. The intersection of criminalization and mental health has resulted in so many deaths. So it seems obvious, I would think, that continuing to involve the police in this at such a high cost of fatality, of injury, um, doesn't make sense when we have organizations that are equipped to counsel people, to intervene in people. And of course, a quite famous program is Cahoots in Argonne, which has been operating for two decades without police involved and has not had a single death. Um, so this sort of overblown idea that, well, you need the police because of the risk is shown that that risk actually, it can be managed. And of course, should you enter a situation where the person, there's a feeling that there's a weapon or there's a risk, of course, the police are still the same call away that they would be anyway. So um, that is one example. But our report looked at other areas as well, traffic. 
um, sexual assault reporting. And of course, people are very familiar with this as well, that the majority of sexual assaults are not reported. 0.6% um, of sexual assaults end up in any kind of um, conviction. We do not have a system that is at all effective in intervening in sexual violence. Yet that is the issue probably most often used when you say that you believe in defunding. People say, well, what about sexual assaults? Don't you care about women? Um, but of course, we have the example of Carrie Lowe. And as Harry indicated before, so often when we've seen police failures, their response is to say, well, we just needed more resources and more officers. We're seeing this in Ottawa right now, right? Well, what we really needed is more officers. And of course, the people in Ottawa are saying, but you had the power to hand out tickets all along. There was an injunction. You weren't enforcing it. Like this isn't that you didn't have resources. It's that you made choices deliberately not to do things. And that happens all the time in policing. If we're familiar with the case of Carrie Lowe, it wasn't the, the problem that there weren't enough officers. They didn't investigate for a year because they did not believe her. And studies show that police continue to believe in rape myths continue to believe in the idea of victim behavior, certain types of victim. And as Carrie discovered, um, and she was actually on the subcommittee, so she was part of doing this work. Um, in her case, the police believed she was a lying drunk. And so they didn't bother to pursue the case. So it wasn't a personnel or a resource issue. It was that the police did not feel motivated as she's calling them being like, you're gonna pick up my clothes? Like, are you going to go to the site? So we see this over and over again. And so far from the idea that, well, we need the police because otherwise, you know, sexual assault be running rampant. We know that in fact, in many cases, the police are an obstacle to investigating sexual assault and to making victims feel safe and heard. So third party sexual assault reporting is something we talk about in this report, which is using again people, and we have a small version, like we have a version of this through the SANE program, right? Through Avalon, where you can get the nurse, you can get your rape kit and you don't have to move forward with the criminal investigation if you don't want to. And so by removing the police from the reporting, more people, particularly people from racialized and communities, communities that might be like somebody who doesn't have status, that's scared of being on the radar because she could be deported. Somebody that is a sex worker and doesn't want police investigating her. People that are scared of the police or CPS, right? That these communities can still report. We get a much better picture of what is happening because you're much more able to see the assault that isn't being reported. There's still an option should people wish to move forward with a criminal case. And also, of course, these organizations are much more equipped to um, connect people to trauma services, to do the counseling that people need, and it is more effective. So these are other examples. So the point is that um, this isn't something that's like so strange or, you know, just like so out of the way that oh, you just can't say this. Like, you just want to destroy the fabric of society. It's in fact, as I said, examples of the way that we've in fact, in so many ways, defunded every other service and then expected the police to fill that role. And that is not the sole, like that's not just because of the police. We can't just lay that at the feet of the police. This is a result of uh, what I think is a radical shift in social policy, particularly since the 1970s of disinvesting from the public, disinvesting from the collective good, disinvesting from health and education and treatment and all the other things that keep people safe. And then in that gap, saying, well, let's fund the police over and over and over again. And then when there's a problem, if there's an unhoused person who we show in the report, people are unhoused, a police, this incredible amount. So there's so much money spent repeatedly, for example, giving an unhoused person a ticket that they cannot and will not pay. Not only is that an incredible waste of resources, but it ends up criminalizing that person because now when they don't pay, they have a breach. And then you are seen as being in contempt of court. You don't pay attention to court orders, but it's not because you don't believe in the power of the court or you're deliberately being a scoff law, you simply do not have the resources to engage in the system. And then because you have breaches, you can actually end up in jail or end up with these criminal penalties that set people into this cycle of criminalization. So it's not just an inefficient use of police resources. It also becomes an inefficient use of the jail resource at $270 a day to keep somebody in jail, then you know the court mechanism. So we see this over all over the place. And yet when you start identifying this, this gets treated as this like strange thing to say, but in fact, it has been strange to involve the police in that. When you put it that way, isn't it strange to have police going and putting a ticket on somebody's tent? Isn't that stranger than saying maybe they shouldn't? Isn't it strange to have something that's literally called health, mental health, and then involve non-health professionals? Isn't it strange to not have trauma-informed people in charge of one of the most intimate violations that take place in somebody's life? And I, I said woman, and I should have said people of all genders are a victims of assault and all gender identities, and particularly queer and trans people and people with disabilities. It's not just women. Um, you know, like, isn't it like 
stranger to do that. So this is part of what we're engaging in the report. The last thing I'll say very quickly, I know these are long answers, I'm sorry, it's complex questions, is that to a certain extent, yes, some of the objection to language is around um, people not being familiar with terms. And some of it is a deliberate way that terrain is wielded, right? That um, it, we could use any language. If, so this idea, oh, well, defunding is not a good slogan. If we called it boycotting or divesting, it would be the same thing because it's the often ideas are turned into culture wars. And we've seen this in some of the response where I think people were in many ways looking what they thought was going to be like a woke rant against the police, which then could be discredited as just, you know, all oh, these wokies. And then when it's sourced and researched, it's harder to dismiss it. I'm not saying there's people out there that aren't dismissing it, but it's harder to take a bad faith take and just say these people don't know what they're talking about when there's data. And so in some cases, we've seen a shift to somehow then claiming that this is actually like conservative, as one person said, that these are actually conservative recommendations. And I'm like, well, fine, if they are, that's great. Like, then that means we agree. And maybe you should be yourself advocating to have policies made public because it is outrageous. And conservatives as well should be outraged that we give so much money to these institutions like police and prisons and have no transparency and accountability. That should be a conservative issue. So often these things are taken up into the culture war and then become charged. And it's not because of the content of the policy or whether it's good social policy or not. It's just, it's the terrain of like this side and this side and this side. And I, I agree. I think that there are things that are very conservative and defunding that could be part of a conservative worldview. Don't give people budgets if they can't account for why. Don't, you know, endlessly download money into something that's proven not to work. These should be conservative values. And if they're not, it's actually a failure, not of me or of us, but of conservative social policy. So, um, yeah, I think with language that it's true that for some people it's unfamiliarity. You do see this a lot where people would say in the surveys, I don't agree with defunding. And then would like go on in the, the material to say things that were clear defunding principles. Like, I don't think the police should be involved in mental health. And like, well, that's defunding. We're often seeing this in Ottawa, right? Like if you're reading Twitter, a lot of people are like, well, why are we paying you $328 million? Like to do nothing. Like a lot of people were basically having that defund conversation. And sometimes you'd see in the comments, people being like, I don't agree with defunding, but I don't see why these people should get money. And everyone's like, that's defunding. So you do agree with defunding. So often people find that when they engage with the idea, even if they don't agree with all of it, even if they don't like some of the content, even if there's things that they think are, you know, challenging, there's often common ground where people be like, I don't agree with defunding, but, and then that, but is actually many of the points that defunding is actually about and that is grounded in policy that already exists. I'm sorry, one more thing. And then Jen, you get to talk. Uh, Ali had a question and I just wanted to um, say yes, exactly. When you ask the first question, I was going to immediately say yes, there's examples of indigenous policing and then you raise that. So a really good example of shifting policing is like the Bear Clan um, that began in Winnipeg because they weren't getting service from the police and just began walking their own streets in their own neighborhoods and handing out food and handing out clean needles and just talking to people and getting to know the people living on the street and intervening. And that's very effective. Drag the Red is another example where particularly after Tina Fontaine, where again, people are like, you're not investigating these things. And the community took it upon themselves to begin like patrolling the river and seeing if there were bodies there. And, and so this, these are examples, particularly in indigenous communities where people have begun doing that work on a street level or in other forms, like having uh, police like on reserve that don't aren't armed and a part of the community. I don't want to romanticize those because many indigenous communities will say there are problems with some of that policing, but it provides other models where you can, it does, Saying that you don't believe in policing doesn't mean that you don't believe in like having social, some form of discipline or accountability. Like it doesn't mean that everyone runs wild. Like the opposition, the opposite to defunding the police is not complete anarchy, let's all go murder each other. Like there are lots of other ways to imagine how we can still um, keep each other safe, how we can still have accountability, how we can deal with violence and harm that don't have to involve a tank or increase weapons or giving more and more money into a system when they can never show us performance metrics, when there's no relationship to the crime rate. Um, so I also think that, yes, there are some very practical examples. And sorry, I talked a long time. I didn't mean to. Go ahead, Jen. I'll talk about anarchy since you mentioned it, L. I think that was a lot of the pushback that I was getting from some of the maybe older and more conservative people in my life when I first started helping out with this report. Well, if we get rid of the police, that's always what they say. If we get rid of the police, there will be anarchy. And it is heartbreaking that we are actually seeing what's happening in Ottawa play out. And that is pretty close to, I think, what a lot of us would have called anarchy. And it's happening 
despite slash because of the police. So it's a heartbreaking example. It's very unfortunate that it's happening, but it's also demonstrating some of what we've been trying to say in real life. But the problem, the other problem with the anarchy argument is that, okay, maybe I today do not have an answer for what the world will look like with no police, but I do have many answers that my colleagues and I have put in this report for what we can do tomorrow to start chipping away at some of the problems that we have with policing. And if you're only focused on the end game, you're not necessarily going to take all the steps that we're recommending, which are implementable right now. And the other thing I would say, for me personally, like I'm a lawyer at a corporate law firm. I'm there right now sitting here in the dark. They just turned the lights out. Um, you know, th these, I've had to rewire my brain a little bit. Like I have always been critical of the police. I did a moot in my third year of law school, arguing for um, basically a criminal code for police powers because the idea of common law police powers just kind of blew my mind. Um, but I have had to become more disciplined about that kind of thinking and really try to rewire my brain and always approach the exercise of state power with a critical lens. And especially when that state power is backed up by the use of force. Um, when I first started working with the working group, somebody, a friend of mine from growing up said, how, who, who has a police officer in their family said to me, how would you feel if, you know, it was defund lawyers, for example, if that was the movement. And I think that was a fair point to an extent. I understand that this kind of language might be very difficult for people who are in that, who work in policing, but I don't carry a gun. No one's gonna give me a tank. Like the, the state authorization for police to use force, I think requires all of us to examine that really critically. I would encourage everybody to look at the regulations made under the Emergencies Act and what they say about policing, what they say about police, peaceful assembly. I think if you approach state power from a critical lens, you're probably going to come on board with defunding relatively easily. So I'll end there. Thank you all so much for those answers. That was terrific. Oh, sorry, Harry. Did you want to add something? Yeah, maybe I'll just add that, you know, the, the heart of the report, and I think what people have picked up on most is points around detasking. Um, I think it's very easy for people to, once, once presented with lots of strong evidence, right, to say, yeah, you know, that doesn't make sense uh, that we would have the police be the first responder at a mental health call, where you have 20 years of evidence that, you know, an alternative model works. And I mean, and, you know, that's the one thing that I re we really kind of got across in those sections of the report is that these aren't kind of like new or radical programs, right? So even to go back, before the report, like the example of sobering centers, that's something that exists in 30 municipalities in Canada, right? So it's a pretty tried and true approach, right? We're not on the vanguard in any respect there. And that's true, I think, of all the detasking areas that we focus on, right? And, and just given the number of responses that we received, so we received close to 2,400 survey responses. We had six hours of uh, public consultation received a, a large number of written submissions and correspondence. We had to kind of narrow down and we picked ones that we thought were representative of people's in, uh, concerns, but also very doable and very evidence-based. Um, but beyond that, like the, the other kind of pillars of the approach, pretty basic stuff, right? So, um, you know, the, the reforms that are kind of internal to both the operations of the police and um, the oversight of the police, are things that I think maybe to Elle's point, like most people I think would get on board with, uh, even if they were sort of fairly conservative, right? A lot of it has to do with ensuring that things are done in an evidence-based way, that um, there's good value for money, right? So for instance, we, we recommend to this point I made earlier about training, that they do a review of training and they say, well, how are decisions made about what training is offered and when, and you know, how can we uh, get some evaluators in here to con confirm that the training we're doing is effective and is actually in keeping with um, the kinds of calls the police are responding to. So, for example, we note that in 2017, when they did that verbal judo training, they get two, two days annually of what's called block training. So they did one day on verbal judo, the de-escalation, and one day on firearm recertification. And you think, oh, okay, well, that might give you the impression that the police spend half the time firing guns and half the time 
verbally de-escalating situations. And that's not true, right? Like if you look at the data, that most police officers never fire their firearm. And most of the time, you know, violent crime only makes up a very, very tiny percentage of all the calls that police respond to. And we corroborate that both with data that the HRP provided to us, but also kind of larger statistics from around Canada. Uh, and so that's that's an example, right? We just say, look, we should be getting value for money on these things. We've got to evaluate these things to ensure that they're done properly, uh, as we would in any other situation, any other business unit in the municipality. And then on the social reform pieces, again, it was we received a huge number of, of uh, submissions, a very, very large number of perspectives. But the kind of, what we ended up settling on was um, kind of two main target areas, right, that came up over and over again. One was about access to affordable housing. And one was about um, mental health and substance use. And, you know, in the final two pillars of the report have to do with uh, legislative and policy reforms on the one hand, and then kind of financial reforms on the other hand. And again, the things that we recommend there are fairly conservative, right? So uh, we recommend that they, for instance, uh, on the, like in terms of a legislative reform <laughs> as it relates to substance use, we said that they should create a working group as they've done in Vancouver and Toronto and a number of other cities to develop a model for seeking um, exemption under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act or um, simple possession laws in, uh, in Halifax, right? So basically decriminalization. Uh, and then we also say that, you know, the HRM can and, and should, and it's actually able to under the HRM charter, the relevant legislation, able to fill gaps through grant programs where uh, for mental health uh, programs. So that's something that the HRM is statutorily enabled to do, right? I know we think of mental health as primarily a provincial responsibility, but there's actually no reason that the HRM can't play a role in filling some sort of those gaps. And on the housing front, we did a similar thing. We said, look, uh, um, we need to dramatically increase our investment in affordable housing. And we went and looked at the data and we said, on a per capita basis, <coughs> spending an HRM on housing is dramatically less than other municipalities in Atlantic Canada. And it was about $2 per capita per year. And even the town of Yarmouth was spending $40 per year, right? And St. John, New Brunswick was spending $100 per year. And all those numbers are in the report for you to look at. And basically what we said was the funding should be aligned with other municipalities of comparable size, right? In terms of how much money we're spending. And then finally, in terms of financial reforms, uh, we also said you can apply those same principles to the police. And so we went and looked at the data and said, well, how much do we spend on a per capita basis for the HRP, looking at the population that that serves, in light of the fact that we are the only municipality in Canada that has two police forces. And we said, well, if you just look at the HRP population, we actually spend significantly more per capita than most cities of our size and the national average. And so we basically just say, try to align it with other cities of our size, right? That's, you know, because we're so much higher, right? So for, to give you an example, in London, Ontario, a city of comparable size to Halifax, they spend $276 per capita on policing. In the area serviced by HRP, it's closer to $350, right? And again, it's a little complicated because certain units within HRP are integrated. But, um, you know, that's that was the recommendation that we made. So try to develop performance metrics, try to look at what they're doing elsewhere. And then finally, try to encourage greater participation <coughs> on the part of citizens in the municipality in the budgeting process, right? We So the final recommendation that we make, and I think it really undergirds everything, is this idea of participatory budgeting, which is the idea that people in the city should have greater say about how their money is spent. And so we we kind of lay out where they do participatory budgeting. The city actually already does it to a very limited extent. But we say, you know, this is the mechanism through which these other things can be accomplished, right? You know, let use participatory budgeting processes to identify what services uh, and what programs are most relevant and most needed to particular communities, right? Either at a district level, um, you know, within particular communities such as the African Nova Scotia community, Indigenous community, what's relevant to those populations, right? And empower people in the municipality to take to actually buy in and engage with the municipality, right? Like, I don't think you need to even say, but like the voting in the municipality is incredibly low. Most people are not engaged at the municipal level, right? So as a final point, we say, you know, yeah, all this is about public safety, about uh, developing a new understanding of community. And part of that has to do with engaging with the municipality differently, right? So that's kind of the full suite of recommendations, just to get back to your original question. Thank you so much, Harry. Um, 
Actually, that was great. I wanted to get into um, some of the recommendations just because we're getting really excellent questions in the chat here, and I want to make sure that we have enough time to go over those. Um, but before we get to that, I just wanted to ask uh, specifically around Chapter 7, um, you talk about broad social reforms, um, and I was hoping um, that the panel could speak to um, sort of the entities other than police that are needed to make your recommendations work. Jen, do you want to go ahead first? You haven't gone first yet. I'm about to sneeze, sorry. No problem. Maybe I'll just speak to recommendation 28, which talks about a municipal grant program. And again, getting back to this idea that defunding has all kinds of complexities, but part of it is about taking money away from pot A and putting it in other pots. And one of the reasons we didn't actually do a line by line, here's how you defund the Halifax Regional Police, was because a lot of our recommendations are about putting this money in social programming, but all of the social service providers that we spoke with, that the committee representatives are involved with, that presented at our engagement session in June, they are so overloaded and strapped. So it's not necessarily that an immediate influx of money is actually going to solve that problem. But the municipality does have the ability over the long term to create a grant program, in our view, that would help. Uh, shore up some of these service providers and enable them hopefully to take on a lot more. Um, and something we often see in this area is this jurisdictional battle. Halifax loves to point its finger at the province and say that's a provincial responsibility. And that's all well and good, but when you have a problem in your city, you're the most immediate level of government that's able to respond. So I think that the grant program as part of that bigger basket of social recommendations is a really important piece because these organizations social service providers need a lot more stable and predictable funding. I think to um, just to move away from specific recommendations for a minute, um, while the police are obviously the most visible, like we see the police in the streets and we do focus on, okay, this officer did this, but of course policing isn't just a practice, it's an ideology. And we have to also accept that we have police because we want police, right? We believe in punishment and control. Um, I've been saying, for example, um, with, I pointed out, you know, that when black people were being policed in COVID, there were no com com there were no convoys for us, right? When Dr. Ngola got run out of New Brunswick, and when the premier basically did all but name him, like identified him, falsely accused him of spreading COVID, it was black people that spoke up, and everybody else gave us racist threats. When in early in the pandemic, there was a international student, an African international student, who was arrested and put into jail in PEI for breaking quarantine because he had a mental health break, and again. Nobody was talking about overreach of government then. So we know, as like I know as a Black person, that our unfreedom is always treated as a normal and acceptable state. And freedom only comes into question when, to be frank, the white majority feels that their freedom is being pressed, right? And these are deeply embedded ideas. These go back to the origins of policing within slavery, within colonialism, the policing, of course, of indigenous territories, the literal formation of the RCMP as a colonial force to encroach upon indigenous territory. Then, of course, they use in residential schools to literally remove children from community. And that's not some just point of historical interest. It's embedded in what we call upon the police for, which is for social control of those groups seen outside of the public, Black people, Indigenous people, queer people and trans people, people who use drugs, sex workers, those with mental illness, people with disabilities, and all the histories of policing and punishment and incarceration are modeled upon these communities. And as long as it's only us, <laughs> hasn't historically been a problem. And people, in fact, call upon police. And the same people, in some cases, that are saying, you know, freedom from mandates are the same people that call for our borders to be closed to us, right? Like, as long as your movement's being controlled, that's justice, but don't control my movement, right? And that isn't just, you know, that sometimes we're getting this very superficial discourse right now. People are like, oh, you know, if it was BLM, you'd be cracking heads. Like people are saying that in Ottawa without really reflecting on this isn't just an act of hypocrisy. This is actually embedded. Like the system is doing what it's supposed to do. Like this is embedded in policing. So I say all that to say that therefore the police are the symptom, like they're, they're the, the product of that. But it's also that thinking, the, the way that we think about society that has to be addressed. Um, we grow up in a society filled with images of policing from like, um, so Wellness Within, for example, did a Christmas campaign like don't buy carceral toys, right? Like the, the Lego jail, the Playmobil prison, the cop dog on port patrol, like between a third and 50% of what we consume in media in any year is crime based. 
and usually showing us like the policing of serial mur murders and you know like multiple rapists that make you like I watch those shows as an anti you know like person that doesn't believe in this I'm like put him in jail beat him right like like they have this narrative catharsis that makes us identify with the force of order that comes in against the evil serial killer right and that is a very very powerful and visceral narrative that has been put into our veins and our brains from birth so it takes a lot of work to say well how do we undo that, right? And that is part of a social shift and also a shift in behavior. Um, I wanna go back to Ottawa and say, what did people find out in Ottawa? They found out that when they went out in their neighborhoods with their bikes or you know, just 25 people going and standing on a corner and saying, no, you are harming us. You need to leave my community. They got people to turn around. They did what the police couldn't do because they had that connection with their community. They had that collectivity and they were able to act. And so much of that power is taken away from us. People, one reason that people are politically alienated is particularly at these times, people feel like there is no way to enter the political system. It happens above you. There's a budget made, it doesn't matter what you think, it's happening anyway. You know, all the government, doesn't matter which party you're voting for, they're all controlled by corporations and capital anyway. Like this is, so you have young people that are extremely alienated. You have people that are very disinvested from political and democratic and collective systems. And part of this is outgrowthing into people saying, well, my individual freedom is, is the most. So how do we reconnect people into systems in their communities? How do we reconnect people into the idea of collective care? Um, and this is not, again, just some mythical thing. We did it in COVID when people were like, okay, I need to bring you groceries because you're quarantined. Okay, we need to raise mutual aid funds because people lost their jobs. Okay, we need the government to district. Suddenly a, a dis deficit didn't matter, right? Because we're like, no, we actually need to give people money so they don't go broke and become unhoused. We need to suspend evictions. We did all these so-called radical things that in normal times you'd have said, absolutely not. We can't suspend evictions. People won't pay their rent, you know? And then when it became a necessity, we were like, actually, we need to do these things to care for each other. So that social shift also needs to take place. So some people have said, you know, well, why did you guys talk about housing? Like, what does that have to do with policing? You know, like the, someone said, this reads like a manifesto, you know, as in like, you know, we're trying to create, like this reads like you're running for office. And it's like, no, these things are connected because policing doesn't exist in a vacuum. It doesn't, cops don't create their own jobs, right? Like somebody tells them it is your job if somebody is asking for change on the street to arrest that person. If somebody's outside of Tim Hortons, you have to police them out, right? Like that is a, a shared ideology that we have all borne responsibility for that have been from decades of defunding social services, of defunding our healthcare system, defunding like absolutely everything and detasking us as people and neighbors and community members from being able to knock on each other's doors or say, is everything okay today? Or like, how do we take care of each other? How do we watch out for each other? And believing that we have to call this external force who is increasingly detached from the neighborhoods in which we live, particularly if you live in a black community or an indigenous community, and it's literally somebody coming from outside your community. So um, housing does matter. The, like daycare does matter. How we treat youth does matter. These are related issues to why we call upon the, the systems of discipline and punishment and control, and then why we continually fund them. So we do talk about an ideological and social shift that has to take place along with thinking about policing, because what we have done is called upon the police to be our front line, our first line of response and our response for everything, when really even the police themselves will say, ideally they would be the last line. Thank you so much. That's terrific. Um, I think it's really helpful to see um, just the recommendations laid out uh, from you and um, rather than just in written form and a very formal report that might just be uh, met with antagonism already just from the title of it. Um, so thank you for explaining what those recommendations will look like. Um, I do want to get into some of the questions here. Um, they seem to be really well thought out and I have a question here for Harry specifically. Um, is the Board of Police Commissioners fulfilling its mandate? And if you feel that it isn't, can you speak to some of the barriers on this? Maybe I'll pass on that one. Is that all right? Maybe, maybe can I let other people answer that question? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Very briefly, yes. I mean, this is why, again, so some people are sort of confused about the pillars and saying, like, what is all of this to do with defunding? But of course, without democratic accountability and an oversight body, um, how do you even begin to talk about like controlling budgets or the police accounting for themselves? So um, what we've seen in boards 
And we're, I keep referencing Ottawa, but it's just there's so much policing news coming out of Ottawa. Like we just saw their board like collapse and have a hostile takeover by the mayor. But we saw the head of the board at one point saying, it's not my job to control the police chief. And it's like, that is literally your job. Like, have you not read the police act? Like, this is your job. But this is actually what has happened to police boards across this country for a long time. That police boards tend to believe that their job is to serve the police. And in fact, it is to serve people. And then when I, for example, when I was telling people I'm doing this report, a lot of people are like, why are you working for the police? You're doing a report for the police. And I'm like, no, it's for the police board. But people don't know the difference because we don't have that education around like what are actually the bodies, right? So just that basic civics knowledge, which is so important in navigating the space isn't given to people. And if you don't have noon to from noon until five on a Monday to go and watch a police board, you're not going to know anything about how they operate, like when you're probably at work, right? So um an internal study that we cite in our report that the police boarded on themselves in 2016 showed that they hadn't created a single policy. They weren't applying policy. Like these are things that are within the police act that they have the power to do. They don't have the power over operations. They can't say, send this out, send this out, have this officer go here, but they absolutely have all kinds of power that boards tend to either misunderstand or willfully not use. And so part of this process was also saying that, yes, like if this is going to be effective, boards need to start asking questions. They need to start saying, like, where's the data? They need to say, do you need these officers? They need to be asking for evidence base. And then they really need to be listening to the public and engaging with like, um, yeah, pub like how can we how can we even begin to, to talk about the police when we can't even go to a board meeting and then we can't present when we're there and we don't know how to like get information and we don't know what policies we're talking about. It keeps us completely unable to engage with the system. And then of course, it the power moves unchecked, right? So yes, governance is this huge piece of thinking about policing. Oh, can I maybe say, I can say two things quick. Like one thing is that governance is actually a big piece of the report too. So there is a whole section of the report which deals with the powers of the board because as I mentioned, like there's lots and lots and lots of examples around Canada where, because police boards as a model exist in every, jurisdiction in Canada. Uh, and they're, they're basically all the same. Uh, and um, Elle mentioned there's this distinction that exists in the Police Act here and that exists in every Police Act between what's called policy and operations. And it's actually not an idea that comes from policing. Uh, it, it's applied in corporate governance as well, right? So a corporate board only has policy powers as well. And then also policy and operations exists in the law of negligence, right? Where the government can't be basically found negligent for making bad policy decisions, uh, which you have to deal with things like the allotment of budgets and things like that. Um, uh, but they can be found to be negligent for operational decisions. And so um, one issue uh, that comes up a lot with a lot of police boards is that there's a lot of confusion around what these words mean, like policy and operations. So at the extreme, as I'll mention, we can't as a board direct the police to go arrest certain people. Uh, actually, the, the ability of the police to initiate investigations uh, and to uh, carry on what's called the policing function on, by the Supreme Court of Canada, which is basically arresting people and conducting investigations, is a constitutional principle derived from the unwritten principle of the rule of law, right? And the, the court recognized that in a case called Charisse uh, from the 90s. Um, but basically, beyond that one core of police independence, it's very unclear kind of where the line between policy and operations is drawn. And so, for example, a report that was done after the G20 protests in Toronto um, by a uh, retired Ontario Court of Appeal judge found that what the police board in Toronto took it to mean was that they weren't even allowed to ask questions about operational matters. You know, they weren't allowed. It was just totally outside the scope of the things that they were even allowed to engage on. And um, Justice Morton found that this kind of attitude, which he just said was completely wrong. Like, how could you even have a policy power? How could you implement a policy and then want to, you know, do the necessary follow-up and oversight work to ensure it's actually being implemented without asking about operational matters, right? Operations is just the implementation of policy. Uh, and so he found that, like, <clears throat> the misunderstanding of the board in this very fundamental way contributed to the massive police brutality and mismanagement of the G20 protests, you know, which led to Missions of inquiry, it led to massive class action lawsuits, you know, and, and not to mention the, the charter breaches and human rights abuses of thousands of people right in Toronto. And so that's an example, and we draw on that report, and as well as another report that was done by Senator Marie Claire uh, into the operation of the Thunder Bay Police Board, 
say, look, there are best practices out there for boards that we should be adopting uh, in order for the board to uh, better understand its role. Um, and I mean, maybe just one last piece is that, you know, the board has a duty under um, 55.3E of the Police Act to act as a conduit for the community. It's, it's right in the legislation. Um, but unfortunately, as I'll mention, you know, the board meets in the middle of the day on a Monday at City Hall. And this was a point that um, long before I was on the board, uh, you know, when, with the working group, we raised it. We said, this makes this incredibly inaccessible. And I know that uh, when Elle and Dr. Lee Genge and I went that very first time in January 2020, we were the only people there. They didn't actually, at first, they, the people, when I got there, the people from security at the City Hall wondered if I was in the wrong place, right? Because <laughs> they said no one had, other than journalists, nobody ever came to the police. Um, and so I think that, you know, this is a shift that's occurring, but, uh, and there are, hope, thankfully, these reports that we can draw on in terms of informing the board's work going forward. And very briefly, um, yes, yeah, so after we did the report, I'm trying to not take, yeah, I know we have other questions, but um, you can check out in the examiner, we have an open letter and we talk about the failures in process that happened after that. So they had a public engagement session on the budget, which was like three hours of the public speaking, but they let the police chief speak first. They allowed CAO Jack Dubay to come and essentially put his thumb on the scale and say that defunding had nothing to do with the budget and they should be treated separately. And also say that discussing August 18th, so that was the clearing of the shelters, the violent, um, which she was responsible for. Um, Harry, disinvest yourself in this part of the conversation. This has nothing to do with Harry. Um, you know, he's like, oh, we shouldn't be considering that. So basically, said dismiss this public feedback. And then they ended up in camera for an hour with the police chief giving data that he was unwilling to give to the public, but that was apparently so important that it swayed the decision of councillors. This is not how process should work in a democratic society. So our complaint isn't whether or not they agreed, did what we wanted, right? It's not saying, oh, well, I said I wanted this and you didn't do it, so you're bad. It's saying that the way that we go about this is fundamentally flawed. How do you hold a public engagement meeting on the same day as then you hold a discussion on the budget and then vote at 11 p.m.? How is that good policy and good process? So um, even through this process, and I believe it that many, you know, many of the board members have said that, you know, they want to adopt these things, they're interested in them, they want to take them seriously, and I believe that, but it's this wheel, unwieldy structure around that people have a very hard time sort of leaving and being comfortable stepping outside. They still see questioning the police chief as like an act of attack and hostility when in fact it's what your job is to ask robust, very critical, very serious questions. Yes, you should be sending them back until they come with the data that makes sense, but that's seen as, you know, being mean or something. So, so yeah, we, we wrote an open letter about that and about how we still engage, are engaging in this process of trying to fight for a fair and publicly engaged process. I can just jump in really quickly. Harry mentioned Section 55 of the Police Act. I spend a lot of time reading legislation and trying to interpret it. And that section is so comprehensive and so powerful. And yet most of the commissioners on the Board of Police Commissioners, Harry excluded, do not really interpret their powers as robustly as they should. And if you actually go and look at Section 55, that will, I think, help answer why we have spent so much time over the last two years focusing on the Board of Police Commissioners. There are no police officers on the board. It is a civilian oversight body. So to us and to me, I think that's kind of the best place to target a lot of our efforts because that's the job they're already supposed to be doing. And I'm just going to shift really quickly. I don't know if anybody saw the op-ed on the 40th anniversary of the Ocean Ranger sinking that was in the Herald earlier this week. And it talked a lot about regulatory failures in the oil and gas industry and this idea of regulatory capture, that the body that's overseeing the industry ends up captured by the industry and trying to do the industry's bidding instead of properly overseeing and regulating. And that has kind of happened a little bit with the Board of Police Commissioners. Not all of them, but some of the commissioners think that they are supposed to act in the best interest of the police. That's not what their job is under the statute. One of the commissioners, who's also an elected city councilor, even said that during the most recent meeting on the budget. So I think we have to be, we have to keep pushing as frustrating as it can be because this body has a lot of potential. Um, as we're seeing in Ottawa, I think when you do pay attention to 
the, the police board, you can start seeing how a lot of the power dynamics in a city play out. But I do think once the attention is there and once the public participation is there, there is an opportunity to make things better. Can we freelance on these questions? Like, do you have to ask them or can we just start addressing them? I like a lot Please of these. Feel free. I know some of them are really good. I'm trying to. Yeah, to, but Bianca, to get I really like the question. Um, there was a good, I, I don't think, I keep saying it was the breach. I don't think it was, but there was a recent, um, just a, a, an article. I, it might've been in the breach talking about how corporations are increasingly donating to police foundations. And they'll often have you believe that that's just like youth sports equipment, but they've also got like drones. They've got like weaponry and tanks. I think Vancouver got a tank out of it. Calgary has got weaponry. They get SWAT teams. So this is exactly one of the concerns and police are starting to use this discourse of like, well, they might defund us. So we can turn to private forces. And it showed that like Enbridge, Senevas, all these oil companies are donating into the Calgary Police Foundation. Um, and that is very worrisome and has been Detroit that has happened, right? Where essentially you have the city collapse and the rich people got their own private policing and it doesn't exist in poor neighborhoods. Like, so poor neighborhoods call 911, like whether that's an ambulance or police and like nothing happens. And then rich people have their own private security. So that's certainly a concern. And we actually are seeing that being enacted, right? That um, and this is what we mean about the social shift, that we can, aliens could come down tomorrow and zap up every police force. But, you know, if we haven't changed how we think about policing, yes, we would just start, pay, rich people would pay private security, corporations would step in and have, right? So this is what I mean about policing being an ideology, but you're certainly correct. Um, the other thing that, of course, happens is every time we identify problems within policing, they somehow get more funding. I mean, I keep hate bringing up Ottawa, but, you know, it's like a complete police failure. And then like, we need more money, you know, um, this is why we need more officers. So. Uh, we saw it in racial profiling, right? They racially profile people and then they're like, well, we just need more minority offers. This is more training. So I guess we need 10 million extra this year. Um, no matter what happens, police somehow manage to turn it into why they need more of a budget. We're failing to police sexual assault, so give us more officers. You know, we're sexually harassing our own officers. Give us more officers, right? So um, yeah, that is, is the difficulty. Michael Jackson, the lawyer, talks about this a lot, right? That crisis is actually part of the life cycle of an institution, that institutions go into crisis and then engage in these forms of reform that then allow it to extend its life. And we certainly see that a lot with policing, that when they are faced with critique, they respond by needing more budgets. And then, yes, they will also and are reaching to private billionaire corporate forces. Amazon is the biggest investor in police technology. The biggest invest makers of body cam is Taser through Axon, that is a subsidiary of Taser. So they make so-called non-lethal weapons that kill people. And then they also make the body cameras that are supposed to stop police from killing people. Motorola has cameras with facial recognition and so on and so on and so on. And this leads into my second point, which is the question about police unions, which is a great question. Yes, police unions are among the most aggressive forces um, in police Every time that um, a measure is hard for, for so stopping, you know, stopping racial profiling, you know, we know it's not stopped, but the fight against street checks or carding, and it, this, we have seen like clockwork, the same thing happen in every city. The police are told it's unconstitutional to card or street check, and Jen would obviously know about this, wrote the opinion on this, and then um, they always claim that this makes it impossible to do their jobs and inevitably there will be a leak from the police union to the media talking about how they've lost confidence in the chief, morale is low, they can't do their jobs. This happens just like clockwork. And so it also, in a sense, makes our point for us because People often want to say, well, you know, this is just a few bad apples. They want reform. But then when you have basic things being put in, like maybe don't be racist, like systemic racism exists, there's a pushback. In Ottawa, Chief Saul, he was the first black police chief. And I'm, I'm not doing the defending him and oh, poor him because he's a police chief and he wanted to be part of a system, right? So, you know, the leopard ate your face. But it was a clear... Uh, points that his own rank and file were very much against him because he said systemic racism exists. So they didn't say, great, we don't want racists in the police force either. That embarrasses us. Get rid of them. They made Nazi memes about him. So, you know, this idea that all we need is more training is completely belied by the culture of police unions that resist every single form of accountability, that fight for officers who are being suspended because they killed people to not be suspended. Desmond Cole in his book talks about how when Dali Monsion beat Abdurrahman and Abdi to death, officers wore wristbands with his badge number with it on it in solidarity. And imagine being a black person stopped by an officer wearing that wristband who's like, I love and I'm proud of and I'm, I'm here for the person who beat a black man to death. Like, so 
yeah, I think in a way it's helpful in that, again, it demonstrates, you know, a lot of the, the myths that people want us to believe that it's just a few people, then why are all of you flying the thin blue line? Like, how is that working? So uh, those are some quick answers. I'm just trying to get the answers in. And that also kind of covers, yeah, somebody said like they don't suspend officers exactly like officer complaints. We do talk about that. Um, so well, just on the union more. point, we should maybe mention that because of a collective agreement increase, the police budget is going to be like 5.7 million in addition to the extra 2 million that the chief asked for. And that that's because of the union. And there are all kinds of questions about whether that piece should have been in the budget that went before the board of police commissioners a couple of weeks ago, but it will be going before councils. So I just wanted to point that out. I'll go ahead. No, that was it. I was just trying to go through the questions and make sure that they were given answers. So if anybody else okay. to run through the Q and A, go ahead. <laughs> Jennifer, you're reading my mind over there. Um, I was actually going to ask about this recent vote um, and how the implications of the vote to increase the police budget in Halifax here, um, what the implications have for your work on the report here. So just to be clear, the board voted to recommend the increase to council. So there is a possibility, however slim, that council will reject that and send it back to the board. I don't know if Harry feels comfortable talking a bit about the process, maybe, of how that is supposed to play out. Sure, yeah. The, I mean, the, so the primary responsibility under the Police Act for the budget rests with the board, right? So the, um, as a practical matter, the, the police are they're not actually their own legal entity, right? They're just a business unit of the HRM, like any other business unit. So like Parks and Recreation is the same, right? They're, they're all part of, of the HRM. And so the CFO for the HRM will recommend a target uh, and say, this is sort of what we want your, your budget to come in around. And then based on that target, the police will prepare a budget. I think generally, I, I don't want to speak too critically, but I think it's almost always higher than the target that's presented right there. You come with a proposal to the board for an amount. And then the board deliberates on um, the amount. And the thing that's distinct between the board and council is that um, because of you know, this importance of insulating decision-making about, uh, about policing from kind of political politics, right? And, and you know, like scoring quick wins for councillors to uh, boost their reelection. Um, the board is the only entity that's able to actually dictate the contents of the budget. So the board is able to say, you know, I think too much money is being spent on this or not enough money is being spent on this, or I think this is an inappropriate line item. So the, the contents of the budget are for scrutiny by the board. Uh, in practice, what happens is that the, the proposal that's presented actually only deals with the overs. So they, they, they'll say our budget last year was 89, now we'd like 91. Here's how we're gonna spend the 2 million, um, which, which I've argued is not in keeping with the police act. Um, but so once that process is completed, it goes to council and council is only able to say either yes or no to the, the amount that's presented. They can't, um, they can comment on aspects of the budget, but they can't uh, dictate that it be changed. But if they say no, it goes back to the board for reworking and then goes back to council to finally be passed. So that's kind of the process. Um, I'll just say that um, we had strategic conversations before we undertook this work. So this isn't something we did lightly. We had those conversations about how does this work get co-opted? How many other reports have existed and been buried? How many community, how much community energy has been spent in these processes that go nowhere and recommendations and don't get picked up? What does it mean to participate in that? That's something that we very consciously talked about among ourselves. And what we decided is that one, it was important to have this kind of public engagement on an issue that hadn't been engaged before. Um, so there's been other things on policing, the Marshall Report, and there is a question also about the Marshall Report in the Q&A if anyone wants to take that. Um, and you know, like the Wortley Report, obviously most recently, there's been all kinds of work by the African Nova Scotian community, the Mi'kmaq community on these issues. This isn't new, but in terms of defunding, it was different. And it did offer this opportunity to engage this conversation. It also was important to me, and I think the people, uh, the rest of us, that these processes are so often led by white men. Um, and so much of this work is led by black women. This is black feminist work in its origins. The Convergence Conference, like where abolition is coined, like the entire board of that was like black feminists, you know, people who identified as black feminists. And then often this work isn't done by black women. And I thought it was important to have a report that 
and we didn't use this traditional structure of like leading or not, but still the, the, the idea of a board empowering a black woman. And somebody said that to me yesterday, like, this is madness. Like, is it, and they, they took, they thought that Canada was awesome as a result and I had to disabuse them, but they're like, you mean your actual board let like a black woman do a report on defunding? Like, how is that working, you know? Um, so I think that can be powerful to people. And then we also knew that this work could be useful to people in other ways. So it's one thing to say, take money from police and give it to housing. It's another thing to say how. Um, so many people are saying that in their own municipalities in New Brunswick, they, they don't even have like police board meetings. They're like, our meetings are like eight minutes long. Like you think your board is bad. <laughs> the last meeting was 11 minutes. So reporters are using the time to just bring up recommendations and ask them like, what do you think about this recommendation in the Halifax report, which is giving them a way to engage with their board. Um, Edmonton did an anti-racism strategy um, and they were, they actually brought me in to just give them some advice and to work together based on doing a community strategy that rejected some of these ideas of top down report and really tried to do community engagement and they have done a really beautiful um, anti racism strategy from a community that's facing racial hate attacks so black Somali Muslim women that are literally having people run up on them in parking lots jump out of cars and beat them having the hijabs pulled off and being told that there's nothing you can do in fact you are the aggressor have got together and started what was a process for them that was really important and they drew on stuff that we did just as we drew on their public safety thing so um, Montreal has said that they've used elements so we didn't just do it for this idea that we never thought, I don't think any of us ever thought the bar was going to be like, great, Elle, thanks for the report. Let's take $100 million away from the police. What do you want to do with it? You know, like that was never going to happen. It was, but what it, we have done is created a document that makes clear how it could be done, that is being used in other places, that is, I think, different than has been done before. We also tried to, as I said, like rethink the process of how policy is made, that it doesn't have to be top down and hierarchical and only the, the province of particular experts. And what happened, you know, maybe council will not pass budget, they probably will, but that's one year, right? This work, freedom work is long work. Um, changing systems is long work. Any of us that engage with these systems, whether it's the prison system, deportation, we know that like every, you have to chip away at it in such like excruciatingly slow ways. Someone once told me about dissertation writing that there's two speeds slow and stopped. And I think that's the same as, as like this kind of work. As long as you're not stopped, slow is okay. You know, so I don't think we ever believed that it would just be co-signed. We knew it would be difficult, but um, I think it did create something. That doesn't mean it's perfect. It doesn't mean that there aren't critiques of this. It doesn't mean that when people go like, why another report, that that's not a reasonable response. These are just our reasons for engaging in this. Thank you so much. Um, we probably only have time for one more question. Um, and I think I might take the opportunity here to ask um, my own, um, just as a person who um, in the future will hopefully be a legal actor um, serving their community, I'm just curious as to um, what sort of roles we can take on or what sort of work we can look to do, uh, both for legal actors and those who are just interested in their community and helping it out. Um, what can we do uh, to help forward these recommendations past um, what's going on right now? I can maybe jump in. Um, I think you can think about doing the work through your paid job, your nine to five or your day to day and or doing it more on an extracurricular basis. And maybe you do both. If you're a defense lawyer, for example, you might also be doing policing related work in your in your spare time. Um, I do think, you know, going back to what I said before about trying to change the way you think, it'll it'll kind of infiltrate everything you do as a lawyer once you've taken that step for yourself. But I think right now, if there's something in this very long report that piques your interest, you know, there are housing organizations that need help. There are uh, addictions organizations that need help. You can find a piece and and work on that, and you don't necessarily feel need to feel like you have to bite off the whole thing. You can just take little bites and and work on one particular thing that interests you at a time. And there, this is an amazing community. Like you're never going to have to reinvent the wheel. There will be somebody working on the issue that you're interested in. So I would say join up with them. Yeah, I would say um, I, I totally agree with all of Jen's points. Um, so maybe a couple other things too, like uh, one thing, you know, and this, this relates, for example, to the police board is just knowing what the rules are, right? And what the police act says 
and having been reading it, right? And then maybe going to a police board meeting, right? That if you went to like two police board meetings, you would know more about the police board than like 95% of the population, right? Um, and, um, and so I think like, you know, as, as someone, as a lawyer, as a law student, you have a particular kind of background, a particular kind of interest, you think critically, you, you read critically. And I think, um, you know, ensuring that rules are, are complied with, right? That sounds super boring. But it's actually a, a, a very important and ongoing task. Like one of the things that I noticed before I this was like, you know, when we first started, when we first started writing letters to the board, was that it says in the police act that there the board is required to create a policy regarding extra duty and off-duty employment for officers. And they hadn't done this. And you know, and you could understand why that would be a pretty important policy to have. Right. In fact, the legislature thought it was so important that they didn't even put it in the regulations. They put it in the act. They said, you know, if you're going to create any policy, make sure you have one of these. Right. And uh, they didn't have one. And so we wrote them. A, I, I wrote them a letter and I said, what the heck? What's going on here? And then and shortly thereafter, a very shoddy policy was made. And what it said was we agree in, you know, the HRP already has a comprehensive policy on this subject and we support it in full. And I said, no, sorry, guys. Actually, in the act, it says you got to define what the word extra duty means, and you haven't done that, right? So you still haven't met the law, right? So even just basic kind of pedantic, ticky tacky stuff like that, you can go a long way, right? Uh, you know, at, as per, particularly at a municipal level. And I mean, you know, Halifax is the biggest municipality in Atlantic Canada, and that's the kind of issues that we're dealing with uh, at a very basic governance level. And so, I mean, um, anywhere there is a municipal police department, there is a municipal police board. And then beyond that, anywhere where there's a contracted RCMP uh, in a municipality, even municipalities like where my partner is from, Colchester B, right? Like big, big area like near Amherst. That's, they're contracted by the RCMP and they're required by law to have what's called a police advisory board, right? And they can't, they don't have the same powers as a police board, but they can make recommendations to the RCMP. And these bodies exist. Like there's, you know, like 30 or more police boards in Nova Scotia. And so, like, you know, if you want, and if you're from a, a particular area of the province, you have a particular passion, like, you can join one of these bodies, right? You can get involved, you can write letters, um, you know, uh, it's, it can be a fairly significant time commitment, and that's a challenge, and hopefully something that in Halifax we're, we're changing soon. You know, I, uh, there was an amendment to the budget that was passed, which was approved in principle, the idea of increasing the budget for the board for the purpose of hiring a staff. Which would be excellent, right? We know we're an entirely volunteer committee that has no staff support. There's no policy person. There's no research person, and so that would be a huge improvement, right? If we had someone who could, you know, they woke up in the morning and their job was to think about the police board. And so I think as a lawyer, you can play a really key role in that really boring way. And then, as you know, as Jen mentioned, you can also become involved. Like you have such a tangible skill; it's so valuable in so many contexts kind of regardless of the area of practice that you have, whether you're doing criminal defense or corporate law, like, you know, I can tell you I'm on the board provincially for the Elizabeth Fry Society. And I have lots and lots, like, lots and lots and lots of experience working in provincial jails. But actually the people who are incredibly valuable on our board are, is our person who does employment law, right? Or the person on our board who knows a lot about finances. So we're kind of regardless of what your interest is, or like tax law, we had to have like a volunteer tax lawyer give us all this advice because we're a charity. Um, and so we're kind of regardless of your area of interest or your area of practice, like there is so much you can do that is like liberatory, right? That is, you know, on an abolitionist horizon, right? And so I, and I think, you know, you don't just have to be doing criminal defense. Um, so I, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer and I certainly, yeah, I mean, Harry gets delegated with all the tasks. I'm like, yeah, just do that bit that I don't want to do. So, and it's really important. Like I'm not, uh, I, I don't like the fine grain stuff of combing through the act. That's not me, but it is Harry's skill. So he's able to bring that skill, not just to this work, but a lot of work. Like if you're friends with Harry, like you get the 3 a.m. drop in your mailbox of like some like obscure document from like North Carolina, but it's really important. So those kind of skills, I'm not saying I don't have research skills, but I'm just saying that that, which I think is a very lawyer kind of skill is really important. Um, in activist work, I always feel like you can walk it so far. You do a lot of the emotional work, a lot of the framing things in public ways. And there's usually a lawyer needed at some point. 
Um, and that's not just criminal or immigration. It's a min law is really important in prisons and stuff like, um, and all of this intersects with um, the unfreedom of people. So yeah, the civil law system, we never talk about it. We always talk about criminal in terms of race, but we know the civil law system is heavily implicated in how people experience systemic racism. We haven't even begun to like unpack that and think about it, you know? Um, administrative law structures, like these things are so far beyond the average person that anybody who can make that legible or do that work, it's a huge part of activism. Um, I can't think of anything serious I've done that didn't involve a lawyer at some point um, giving their time. So um, you can give your time into community, like stuff that, yeah, maybe like a boring skill that you do at your boring corporate law firm in the day becomes a really important activist skill in the evening. So I really encourage people to find that and to give that energy into your communities. Um, find the things that you're good on. There's someone who needs it. So thank you for listening tonight. You also answered some questions, Harry. Someone was up wondering if um, members get paid and how they get appointed. So you kind of answered that. I know that Jen okay. has a hard stop, so I don't know. Um, I just wanted to say too, despite all the talk about boring stuff, Jen's, Jen's way less boring than I am. I'm the boring one. She does the cool corporate, she's doing the corporate law stuff day in, day out. I'm really the boring one. So, you know, less just, boring. That's if you, such if you a good couple to end on. Yeah. Oh, yeah, when you hang out with lawyers and it's like, well, I don't know about this word on line three. And the, you know, it's like, oh, shut up. It's fine. He's good. Print it. You know, I'm a poet. So I'm like, yeah, he's printed. <laughs> like, but that's good, you know, and it's the different ways of thinking, the different ways of approaching the world, but also, yeah, just that dedication. So um, this couldn't have got done if I had been stuck doing the loan that y'all would be waiting another 20 years. I couldn't have got done without like this team of people. Um, it was love work for, uh, Tahari called today our love letter to the city. We did this work for free um, because we wanted to make a change and we wanted to do something substantial. And, you know, just, uh, it was beautiful. We did it together and, you know, in a lot of love and friendship and um, comradeship that is part of the work of freedom and abolition as well, which is building those relationships, using our capacities and giving of ourselves to the collective good. So I feel like we did our best to do that, so. And I think that that is a wonderful way to wrap up this event. Um, Elle, Harry, and Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this was an absolutely interesting talk and I was very honored to be moderating for you tonight. Um, also, thank you all to our participants. Um, if you tuned in late, this was recorded and it will be posted. Uh, just keep an eye out for the Criminal Justice Coalition post on that. Um, and please join us for our next event, which is March 3rd, um, and that will be looking at the Cultural Reports and African Nova Scotian Justice Institute, and that panel will be looking at the work of the Institute and the impact of the race and cultural assessments. Um, but yes, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. And be sure to look at the Criminal Justice Coalition's Instagram page, as well as the Dalhousie Criminal Law Students uh, Facebook page. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.